Hi everyone, um, welcome to um, the Allied Health, um, Promoting Health and Wellbeing for NDIS Clients CPD event. My name is Hannah Coffey and I am the Intellectual Disability Project Coordinator at Central and Eastern Sydney PHN. Also working with me today is Bertha Harvey, CPD Program Manager, and my colleague Claire Woods, one of the Intellectual Disability Service Navigators here at the PHN. I'd like to start by acknowledging um, the traditional custodians and sovereign people of the land across which we work. I recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. I also extend that respect to Aboriginal colleagues joining us today. Today's CPD event is being delivered as a component of Project GROW, which is a Commonwealth-funded pilot program aimed at improving health outcomes for people with intellectual disability. Alongside CPD events, the GROW team provide in-practice training to GP and allied health practices on communication techniques, reasonable adjustments and quality improvement activities. This training uh, is open to all allied health practice staff, including reception and admin, and can be tailored to the needs of the practice. For more information, um, email the Intellectual Disability Team or visit the GROW Project website. Um, as we just wait for a few final um, attendees to join, I'm just going to flick through a few slides of some of the other programs that are running at the PHN at the moment. Um, there's some resources um, around COVID, domestic violence, um, DFE Assist program runs in a similar way to our intellectual disability program, and they can provide in practice training and support to health professionals um, to recognise and respond to signs of domestic and family violence for their patients. Um, there's a couple of new mental health support um, directories. Um, and as I mentioned, Project Grow, uh, you can scan the QR code or as I mentioned, um, send, us, send us an email if you'd like any further information. I'm going to stop sharing these slides and ask Claire to share her PowerPoint as I um, introduce our first speaker, Dr. Kim Bulkley. Um, Dr. Bulkley is a senior lecturer at the University of Sydney, Faculty of Medicine Health. Kim coordinates the new interdisciplinary disability and participation major, is a stream leader in the Centre for Disability Research and Policy, is president of Disability Spot and co-lead of the um, World Health Organization Collaborating Centre for Strengthening Rehabilitation Capacity in Health Systems. That's a mouthful, Kim. Um, Kim has a long history in the disability sector, working in frontline roles, policy development and research for over 30 years. Kim is passionate about increasing access to high quality services and supports for people with disability using mixed methods research approaches that engage directly with individuals, communities and stakeholders. So thank you, Kim, for joining us today and um, welcome. Okay, <clears throat> thanks. Thanks, Hannah. Thank you for that um, introduction. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to um, just thank thank everyone for the opportunity to be part of this webinar and to partner with um, the, the PHN team and Project Grow particularly uh, on this important topic. Um, it's close to my heart, both in my role at the University of Sydney, but also in my role at Disability Spot. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. So before I begin, I'd also like to acknowledge the, um, the, that I'm joining from the unceded lands of the Darawal people south of Sydney, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us today. We have much to learn from this ancient and enduring culture. Next slide, please. So the learning outcomes for today um, are, are listed here and they were on the event, right? So I won't go through all of them, but I will try and address the first two uh, and then we'll have a breakout room activity and then um, other members of the presenting, presenting team will, will go on to uh, address some of the other um, outcomes there. So I begin with um, a look at a currently accepted definition uh, or international definition of disability. And I think that's a really important place for us to uh, go to lift our heads up and really consider um, what is, uh, it, it is that we're meaning um, when we're thinking about disability. disability. Um, oh, I'm getting, I'm getting feedback. Uh, anyway, um, uh, okay. Um, so, Disability does include a, a recognition of impairment, 
but we are also recognising the impact of social and environmental barriers as a significant part of disability and the experience of disability. So the causes of disability related to impairment do not just reside in the individual with the impairment. So this definition is taken from the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disability. Um, so it is also important to recognise that persons with a disability need access to health supports to promote the best outcomes. So the next slide, sorry. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, to promote the best outcomes and to recognise that people with disability have healthcare needs just like others who don't have disability. This summary from the World Health Organisation provides an international perspective about the barriers to receiving healthcare. And you can, can read these, but you know, particularly uh, people with disability are two times more likely to find healthcare providers skills and facilities inadequate three times more likely to be denied healthcare and four times more likely to be treated badly in the healthcare system. Uh, finances and funding are a significant issue for people with disability in accessing um, healthcare and the need for assistive technology and devices uh, is really important. And again, um, the issues around access to those is something that I think we as allied health professionals can really be uh, you know, a part of and uh, ameliorating and be aware of as a significant issue. So all of these factors, I think we need to consider as allied health professionals. And we'll talk about this more as we go through. The next slide, please. So I wanted to just do a really brief introduction around disability frameworks because um, there is very much now, uh, uh, as acknowledged in the definition that I gave you in the earlier slide, um, a recognition that social components are a key part of the experience of disability. So I pulled this document um, that is was done by Shane Clifton um, as part of his work with the Disability Royal Commission, and I put it into a word cloud. Um, and so this was about disabilities theories and models. And you can see what came out loud, loudly here. Um, social, the social uh, perspective is very strong. But if you look in here closely, you will also see other aspects. There is stuff around rights, cultural aspects, uh, um, medical issues, health. So there are many things that contribute to how we frame um, disability. Go to the next slide, please. So it's about the and. Um, in the past, a medical model of disability was the dominant narrative, and now we've moved to a social model of disability being a more dominant narrative. Um, but I think we have to make sure that we're getting a balance right here, that we're not dismissing one over the other um, so that we see where they fit and how we can uh, understand and apply a framework in our work as professionals in working with and supporting people with disability. So if you move to the next slide. So the ICF, the International Classification of Functioning, is a model that was developed in Australia and it's a biopsychosocial model that combines multiple domains and factors with a, a, a focus on functioning all the way through. So you can see that the health condition is part of, the, of, of uh, this process. Body functions and structures, are, um, you know, which would where, where you would have um, uh, some of the impairment issues in the health condition and body function structures. Then activities and participation in the, looking at it from a functional point of view, and then environmental factors and personal factors. So these um, this model brings those sort of historically opposed at times uh, perspectives on disability together. And I encourage you to really keep this sort of frame in your mind when you're working with your clients, perhaps starting with a participation lens and then working back to the other factors that are impacting on the persons with disability, the person with disability that you're working with um, in, in achieving participation. And we, we can't ignore health conditions and body function structures as part of that conversation. We just go to the next slide. So that first slide is, is the helicopter view of the ICF. Um, and this is actually just explaining a bit more about what 
the other components of the ICFR. So this taxonomy, so the detailed bits, um, helping us to understand, uh, you know, in detail, collect data to um, really drill down into what are the components um, that make up those boxes that we saw in the first um, slide around the framework. So um, it, it does help you to really check yourself if you go in and have a look at some of these things. Not everybody needs to go into this level of detail, but there are resources available online um, that you can uh, use to um, understand more about this and, and to perhaps prod yourself around what might be um, some of the areas that you might need to consider. But it always goes back to a functional perspective of disability. It's not just about the impairment or health condition defining the person with disability. We go to the next slide. So I think the value of the ICF is that it does combine the major models of disability. It recognises the role of environmental factors in the creation of disability, um, that it's not just about the impairment, and that we keep a focus on participation as the desired outcome. It does, however, also bring in the importance of underlying health conditions and their effects, and it lets us have a framework that brings all that variety of information together so that you can uh, assemble it and relate it to each other and see, well, do I need to pay more attention to this aspect for this particular person or that aspect? So um, I think the ICF is a, is a tool that we can make uh, good use of. Next slide, please. So the other bit that I wanted to do um, today in introducing this topic around health issues for, for people um, with intellectual disability particularly is um, highlight the findings from the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation. Uh, and health issues have been a key uh, finding of that um, uh, commission. And so some of the barriers faced by people with cognitive disability when accessing and receiving healthcare and services uh, include barriers to communication and health professionals' attitudes, values, and assumptions. So these findings are right in our lane. In the, in the work that we do, um, these are issues that we need to be aware of and we can address. So our attitudes, our values and our assumptions are getting in the way of people with disability getting good service, with intellectual disability getting good services. So the issues around training and education of health professionals with respect to patients with, with um, cognitive disability was an, a, another factor. So, you know, engaging in training and ongoing uh, development of skills and knowledge around what are the issues that, that face uh, people with intellectual disability, but also what are the skill gaps that we have as professionals. Issues around delayed diagnosis and misdiagnosis of, of people with cognitive disability, a lot of that relates to communication issues uh, and assessment processes, but you know, it is a broader issue as well. And it was also found that the life expectancy of people with cognitive disability was reduced um, uh, and you know, that's just not good enough to have that lack of equity in our health systems and that there were identified special, special, specific issues for First Nations people with cognitive disability in relation to the um, healthcare services and supports that they received. So there's some pretty serious findings, right, that um, these, the, the way we're providing health, to, health services and supports to people with intellectual disability are coming up in a Royal Commission. The next slide. Um, so they came up with some suggestions around what we might um, be able to uh, address or some of the measures that could be put in place. So I present these to you as a, a something for your reflection around, you know, what is it that we need to um, be doing in, in our sphere as allied health professionals to address some of these things. So we need to expect and deliver quality healthcare to people with uh, intellectual disability. We need to understand um, attitudes, assumptions, and culture that exists in healthcare services and really explore our implicit biases and the things that we can change as professionals in, within ourselves, but also within our organisations to change the culture uh, around 
uh, low expectations, I guess, and, um, and poor service delivery. We need to think about communication and information sharing um, with people with, with differing communication needs uh, and really check ourselves as to how we're stepping up to that um, instead of shifting that responsibility to, to our clients. We need to take much more uh, uh, responsibility for uh, you know, sharing and communicating well. We have to understand the health system challenges that our clients experience and, and provide assistance where we can and, uh, you know, to, to overcome those health system challenges. We need to look at health with a longer lens, with a longer horizon, so that we really look at this over a lifetime and look at prevention and primary care. Now, for instance, sedentary behaviour and obesity, um, malnutrition, um, these kinds of issues that I know when I first started working many years ago, were considered to be part of the, um, you know, a normal life course for, for some people with um, disability, when in fact it was about not providing the right kind of care and support and prevention and support, primary care supports over time. We need to have to think about how we can collaborate and integrate health and disability services. You know, we don't have to be overlapping and standing, standing on each other's toes, but we need to do a better job at referring and integrating um, the way that we're providing supports. We need to think about reduction of distress and trauma for people with intellectual disability. Um, some of that's to do with communication, but it's also about recognising and owning that, you know, different procedures might be um, traumatic. Um, and uh, we need to think about training and education, data collection and initiatives to improve healthcare. Okay, so um, with these things in mind, we want you now to go into a breakout room. We had a mix of people in our room, so people who worked in early intervention and then, and then also people who worked with adults in an exercise physiology kind of, um, you know, healthy healthy lifestyle um, approach. So, um, but, but all people could see how the health issues impacted uh, them. Um, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll be a little nitty gritty. So, you know, with, with younger children, things like medication side effects and how to, you know, manage that conversation with health, other health professionals to bring it into a functional perspective to get that balance right around medication, dealing with something, but not then making things, you know, really difficult. So how to do that better and how to get that balance right. And then, for example, another one was with constipation in, in young children where, you know, that can then have some, unwanted um, uh, implications when uh, that's being addressed but obviously it's not main, not you can't keep going in a constipated manner for the rest of, you know without dealing with it um, so you know really get it get it, just getting that conversation because it's a very common issue in young children um, with with disability so really recognizing that relationship between the perspective of the the allied health professional in a uh, functional context with uh, other health professionals who are providing medical support and how to you know really get that um, conversation going well and then the primary health kind of roles around um, uh, exercise um, physiology approaches again communication um, understanding how to get uh, ideas and information across to the client as well as to the other people in their contexts done Great. Um, I'm happy to kind of follow on from that. Our group, um, we, there was a, a client we talked about from the Northern Territory. And I think from that, you know, you really realise the limitation of services. So having an understanding of the limitation of services for that participant is really important. Um, but then also understanding when to advocate uh, and who to advocate for um, and, and really having that systemic approach. Um, yeah. And, and to be able to kind of, yeah. <clears throat> See, see the full the full picture in order to kind of direct um, services where they're where they are best suited. Yeah, I think that's the only, that's the only thing we kind of add to that. Um, Hannah, thanks, Claire. Um, yeah, I think we can. Uh, we're all sort of on the same track. We talked a little bit similarly, Kim, to uh, about that communication, um, and that's just so crucial for these patients. That that yes, they might be coming to you as a physiotherapist for their physical disability, um, but obviously there is a lot more going on, um, and really the the what is needed is really sound communication, whether that be with other allied health professionals, both within 
the workplace that you're in um, or with GPs, um, allied health professionals in other workplaces that may be seeing that that client, um, but then also disability support workers. And that's sort of, because we talked about the challenge of that. Um, we also talked about... Um, a bit to your point, Claire, about seeing that whole picture, um, some of the limitations are in particular around the NDIS is it's sort of hard to break away from that classification of a physical disability and that person has a physical disability and they are getting supports for that physical disability or they have a cognitive disability and they're getting supports for that cognitive disability and, and you almost do have to, it, it, it's not, the system doesn't sometimes allow for you to kind of step back and go, okay, well, what else is feeding into this um, this, this person and their needs? It's just some of the challenges that were, that were talked about within our group. Was there anything else you wanted to add, Tess? Yeah, so we, we similar had, you know, discussions about how to communicate with the medical teams and sort of their recommendations and how then the allied health practitioners can help put them into practice um, and how they make sense for the actual family and the person. So, you know, often sort of there's this ideal world of what the medical profession would really like and these are, you know, the gold standard, but actually how that plays out, um, you know, for the person and in reality is a little bit different. Um, and subsequently the person, you know, might be in hospital and the, you know, the hospital system are looking at one lens, they're looking at one focus and don't necessarily understand what's happening in the disability world for that person. Um, so that that sort of siloing of us and them um, and the impacts that that can often have on the holistic health of the, for the person. This is now going to talk about um, some of the specifics that she has experienced in her um, in her uh, role. And Tess is a colleague from Disability Spot, um, amongst other things. <laughs> um, so we've partnered with um, uh, the Primary Health Network today to bring this uh, uh, webinar to you. Thank you. Yeah, so and um, as Kim sort of painted the picture that sometimes that problem of trying to improve the health outcomes for the, the people that we work with, seems ginormous and seems like it's such a huge, but you know, we, we don't make a lot of progress and we have such a long way to go. Um, but really what we need is for everybody to play a part in it, that we all in we all need to do our little bit to try and nudge those statistics and those health outcomes forward. So we all really have a role to play here. Um, and what that role is, is hopefully what we can sort of unpack together. So, um, as Kim explained, so I am an OT by background and I am currently um, employed by the Sydney Local Health District um, and I'm an executive member of SPOT. So I've been a member of SPOT for quite a number of years, sort of since ADAC days. Um, and what SPOT's allowed me to do is while working in this health silo to still maintain that um, information and um, links with the disability world. It's being able to understand what, um, the, the clinicians working in disability are really experiencing and seeing um, and learning about, and while still adding my perspective um, with the patients that we work with, looking at more of a holistic health sort of an outcome. So our clinic's based at Concord Hospital. So what I'm hoping to go through is a little bit of information about some of the screening questions that you might um, include in, in your initial assessment with patients to help highlight some of those health issues what you can do um, and how you can play a part in um, preventative healthcare primarily, I suppose. And then when perhaps things are outside of your control and where you might send those, um, send patients if you do have an issue or a concern that um, is a bit outside your scope of practice. So starting with screening questions, these are the, some of the things that you might consider including in, in your initial assessment. And some of these questions probably you ask as a matter of course, um, but what it also allows, I think, is for carers or parents or the, the, the patient themselves included, is having a holistic look at their healthcare, their life, their participation, their tasks, and talking through in a reflective way what their life is like. And this might also happen at an NDIS review point, um, but having a look at what are all of the bits of this person's life and how they might all interact on each other? Do they have a regular GP? Do they have someone in their healthcare system that knows them well 
so that when they do have a concern, they have a place to go. Do they see a dentist? What's their nutrition like? Um, not just what the variety of foods they eat, but also with the timing of the day that they eat those foods, where they eat those foods, meal times as, as an activity. Um, does the person have good quality sleep? Do they have regular chest infections? Do they have swallowing concerns? Bowels, as Kim mentioned before, um, even with children, is a huge issue with adults as well. It is um, gastroenterology problems is one of the major reasons that patients come into the emergency department in hospital. So if we can work on some of those preventative health cares, we will hopefully see some progress in the longer term um, to reduce the amount of time that people spend in hospital. Um, does the person have any exercise in their week? And then any other conditions that you might need to be aware of. So there are lots of ways that you could play a part in how we can prevent healthcare problems um, and help people to access healthcare when and if they need it. So one of the ideas is that you could build examples of healthcare appointments into your sessions. So could your communicate communication practice be around the wording that you might need to explain how you're feeling using body parts what language might be used when you go into a healthcare appointment using play-based um, programs around having a blood test having blood pressure um, building that positive connection with being able to go to the GP is there a cafe near the GP that you could use becoming so that that becomes a little bit more part of the person's world and part of the person's life so that perhaps when they do need to end up in a healthcare facility, that it is not this um, totally foreign, very unknown type of experience when they're critically unwell. Um, ideally, we would probably have people see their GP and their healthcare, um, healthcare practitioner reasonably regularly so that it doesn't become only this place to go to when you're feeling anxious and unwell. We had um, a patient who we've been working this year on coming into our clinic she had um, not seen her GP since she was a little person. Her mum used to just go to the GP and um, talk about the, the issues um, and get scripts. And, and the GP actually hadn't seen our patient face to face for a very long time. Um, and we also were unable to um, see her face to face. But we've had the OT doing some play-based sessions on how to win, you know, what it's like to come into a clinic, having blood pressure, doing some of those interactions. And the speech pathologist has added a whole lot of different words to her um, communication device for her to be able to explain how she's feeling so that mum can prepare her for what the session might be like coming into the hospital, which is where our clinic is based. And the behaviour support practitioner has also been working on reducing her anxiety around change and transitions and the language that mum uses. And we've managed to make some huge progress with this, this um, lady, which is amazing that everyone in the team sort of had this same focus, same um, working on getting her calmly into our clinic before there's a problem. Um, and it's amazing how just everybody working together um, on this one goal, we've seen huge amounts of progress in a relatively short space of time. Um, the other prevention I think that allied health clinicians particularly play a role in is that health literacy. So we work a lot with group homes and often you'll see that the group homes take a wait, for example, twice every month, but they don't know, actually know what to do with that information. So they might notice that somebody has a, a, some weight loss but they actually don't um, do, do, know what to do with that information. So we can often play a role in that building health literacy on how important exercise is, how important nutrition is, and how important oral health and preventative health care is um, for our patients. We're the ones in the families, you get to have lots of conversations with families, more than they would probably have with their GPs or other, other people in their lives. We also, I think, have a role in building that participation in their society um, and looking at the longer goal for some of our patients around their well-being, their mental health um, and reducing their isolation. So we see a few people that um, have historically always had their 
uh, physiotherapists, their speech pathologists, all of their allied health come into the home. They've often even had a home visiting GP. So that reason to leave the house um, is often reduced. And that over time can often result in a person who is then anxious about leaving home. So sometimes having a look at what your practice is currently and if that practice um, for the patient or the behaviour for the patient or things, if you extrapolate that, what happens if that continues over time? So will this person end up not being able to come into the, into the community, participate in their community? Because actually we've always um, either um, built supports around that person within their home and not allowed them to experience those going into the community. So and our, we've dealt a little bit with the prevention, but then it's also important to recognise when you need to um, take a healthcare or a concern or a problem and escalate that problem. And this is not about you having all the answers. It's not about you knowing exactly necessarily where to go. Um, it's about having that general feeling of I'm a little bit concerned, my patient is a little bit concerned, or my family, the family I work with or the support workers are a little bit concerned. And when we might need to help that person put those concerns into words that they could then go and visit their GP. Because what often happens is that that family might take their person into, into a GP appointment, but their concerns um, aren't always then well articulated in what is often a very, um, could be a short GP appointment, or they don't understand that they could um, be supported in, in that GP appointment by a short note from you or um, some assistance in helping them articulate what particular, particular concern might be. And some of the things that might be a red flag are some unintentional weight change or some general lethargy that seems to last. Changes in mood, behaviour, sleep, pain, behaviour are all sort of those indicators that maybe it's time that this family um, or this person goes and sees their medical professional to discuss any concerns. And then escalating that issue and we um, in those breakout rooms obviously that was a key thing about communication with the healthcare team and how we do that and I'm not sure I have a, um, a magic wand to to make that simple I'm afraid um, but some ideas might be that you write a letter or an email or a fax to the GP with your concerns um, could the family um, link you into the GP appointment? Could they phone you while they are there? Could you be part of the telehealth support? Um, how can you put your thoughts um, to ensure that that, that healthcare professional um, is aware of the, the fact that you are part of the patient, the support network for that person? Um, and we were also talking a little bit about um, the different specialties like the neurologist or the gastroenterologist. And some of those teams are a lot harder to, to get um, contact with. Um, and sometimes the nurse is the way, is the easier way to um, get some of the information that you need from those specialists. But also those specialists also write back to the GP. So the GP is, is sort of that key person in this whole story that should hold all of the information for the person, um, all the health information and be able to um, make sense of all of the, the information and provide advice to the, pe the person. Um, ensuring that you um, link with the wider team, the wider support network um, around that person is also really, really important. Um, we recently had a, a patient referred who was 19. Um, he was referred by his GP. Um, he'd had some increase in his seizure activity. Um, and he, he, he and his mum came in, mum um, very concerned, obviously, about what the, seizure, the increase in seizures might mean for, for our patient, um, but also just the general um, lack of sleep that was happening, how um, that he hadn't been to his overnight respite for quite a while because she was too worried about what happened if he went to respite. So we ended up organising a case conference with the support coordinator to try and talk through how we could get him back to respite to give mum a break. But the support coordinator also invited the behaviour support practitioner to that case conference, which 
was the key person that actually had all that additional information, all the um, understanding of the history of where things were, what he was already like prior to this change in his medical um, needs. And they really were the key enabler person that um, made all of the, the next flow on effects happen. The, the understanding that the doctor needed to change some of the medication because actually the medication regime was never going to be able to be met based on all of the other things that were going on in this person's life. They had the understanding about um, you know, the respite team and who was supporting him at the respite house and what some of those adjustments might need. So without that case conference, without that linking from all the other bit parts, we never really would have made as much progress as we did with this patient. So really understanding that you hold a huge amount of information for these families and you can be that link between what you see in the home and the, the healthcare team to be able to make really amazing gains for some of these patients. And then there's also the thought of whether review from a specialist team is necessary. So the Ministry of Health as one of their little, um, you know, drops in the pond to help uh, improve the health outcomes do have specific teams who work with people with intellectual disability. And this um, is their contact details. And some, um, these are the six districts that have teams and they also, um, also outreach to the districts who do not have teams, would all have a nurse involved. Um, so there are ways for um, more support for patients who need um, a little bit more perhaps specialised care than what the GP is able to provide. So that was my part of the story. And then having it, um, I'm happy for any questions now or perhaps after the next build session, but also just thinking about what's one thing that you could perhaps change. What's one patient that perhaps you have been having that niggling feeling in the back of your mind about just not sure what's going on there, but I have some concerns um, and how you might be able to enable that person to access the health there aren't any questions in the chat but are there any questions um, for Tess at this point we will have a longer time for questions after my quick presentation um, so if you did want to think of some questions um, both Kim and Tess will hang around um, to answer those so just throw them in the chat um, while you think of them um, so I'm happy to Hannah um, did you want to introduce me I'm more than happy to introduce you, Claire. <laughs> Claire works with me on um, on our project Grow, um, which I mentioned earlier to this. Um, the project is a federally funded pilot program aimed at improving health outcomes for people with intellectual disability by supporting healthcare um, primary care um, workers and, and both GP and allied health across our region. Um, Claire previously worked for the Council for Intellectual Disability and facilitated um, and helped with the development of the My Health Matters folder and, and various other resources um, supporting health outcomes for people with intellectual disability. Over to you, Claire. Thanks, Hannah. Um, as um, the learning outcomes will say, well, I'm speaking to um, understanding um, some reasonable adjustments, but also understanding the primary health network. So I'm not quite sure how many people have attended any CPD events um, with us. So I thought that I'd give a bit of an overview um, of what the primary health network can, can do for the allied health space. Um, I'm just going to quickly, we've just put together this video in the last couple of months. I um, Funnily enough, I'm wearing the same outfit in the video as I am now. So um, uh, without further ado, I will play the video. We're here to support you as health professionals deliver high quality care. We provide information and training. We assist you with digital communications. We advocate for health system improvements. And all of this is to enable you to deliver person-centred healthcare. We also collect health information and information on the services available in our local area. And we use this information to fund services that meet community needs, including a wide range of mental health and wellbeing services, drug and alcohol treatment services, and other services for chronic health conditions. 
We help you connect your patients to hospitals, aged care services, disability support services, through tools such as Health Pathways and a wide range of support programs. I'm very proud of the work that we've been doing at Central and Eastern Sydney Primary Health Network. All of the board directors are very impressed by the dedication of our staff. We work with local health practitioners like GPs, physiotherapists, other allied health providers, pharmacists, in trying to improve the quality of the care that they provide and also supporting them with up-to-date information that hopefully makes their job easier. I'm also particularly pleased with the work that we've done in commissioning services for underserviced people who live within our community, such as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, people who's living with homelessness, people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, and people with mental health conditions. My involvement with Sespan has been in the vicinity of six to seven years. In that time, I've been a consumer of different services that they've programmed in the area and uh, also I've assisted with some of the working groups and programs that are based in the area as well. I have nothing but good to say about the, uh, the organisation. PHN is essential for our work. We use health pathways, I'm part of antenatal shared care and we use aged care, mental health, palliative care and obviously it's a part of our daily education because we attend the courses provided by CESPEN. The other beneficial thing for us is that CESPEN actually provide us you know, information about our local communities, population, their need, cultural diversity and needs for our patient to provide the best possible care with the best outcomes for our patients. I think the PHN is very important as it makes sure that everyone has access to the same healthcare information. The more we can educate the community on the services they need, the more confident they are to treatment services and takes pressure off our hospital systems. There's so much information out there about the different types of treatment services that I do believe healthcare is just becoming more and more confusing. So I believe the healthcare networks help us direct the community towards more evidence-based treatment practices, which stops patients having to waste money Sorry. Money on treatment services that aren't backed by clinical research. Hopefully that gives a, uh, a nice overview of um, what we do. Essentially, the Primary Health Network supports clinicians, um, but we also support services by funding um, individual programs um, that support vulnerable communities within our region. <clears throat> Um, so part of um, what we do is, um, most, most of what we do is funded by the, the federal government. Um, recently, um, there was a national roadmap um, released for improving the health outcomes for people with intellectual disability. Um, and um, part of that was the primary care enhancement program, which is what um, GROW sits under, which is the project that Hannah, um, Hannah and myself um, Work with work in so the um, the primary care enhancement program is to improve the health care for people with intellectual disability, improve skills of health professionals, increase the um, increase access to intellectual disability health resources, and enhance the care pathways. Um, so grow model is. Um, is education, navigation and advocacy. Uh, we offer in-practice training and service navigation for um, allied health professionals um, and GPs within our region. Um, and recently, uh, in May this year, CESPEN launched a, um, the highly anticipated allied health strategy. Um, this strategy um, as kind of pointed out here, these are the key kind of opportunities. Um, but one of the things that I really wanted to talk about um, today is um, is the digital health um, aspect of it. I might just skip over this just because of time. Um, but digital health um, is is a really important thing for for patients with intellectual disability. Um, and CESPEN is able to offer that one on one support to practices um, to um, to to get you all online. Um, so things like the use of my health mass uh, my health record um, and telehealth are things that are really um, beneficial to patients with intellectual disability due to um, you know 
maybe not being able to to have that oral recall, um, but also um, not uh, confident in their capacity to to provide those informations um, to to the other health professionals that they're with. Um, the targeted groups are, are are here listed here, um, but yes. I've added a lot of stuff into this slide here. All these slides will be available at the end of um, the presentation and we'll send it out. Um, the, the link here has uh, is a link to the actual strategy, um, a membership, but also um, a video that we put out in May um, with the digital health manager who speaks to all the different um, services that and support that's available for Allied Health. Uh, now, reasonable adjustments. Uh, we at GROW have to straddle an interesting line in our work. Our project is influenced by people with lived experience, their needs and requirements to fully participate in their healthcare, along with the horrific stats of preventable hospitalisations and deaths of this population. It's also influenced by the realities of the healthcare system an industry that's struggling on multiple fronts, um, having just gone through the worst, hopefully, of the pandemic and the complexities of running a business. But change, even minor ones to your practice, can have a massive impact, not on just the patient feeling your service is access accessible, but as a cumulative effect on people's long-term health outcomes. So if we break that down, reasonable adjustments provide access to healthcare, for the person with intellectual disability, and I think we all understand this, yet access isn't where it stops. So how do long-term health outcomes improve? I'm happy to inform you that reasonable adjustments work both ways and they are mutually beneficial when embedded into practice. The reasonable adjustments that you make can enact a space for you to gain access to that person you are treating. You get to build a relationship with them and you know, and you get to know who they are and perhaps, and, and, and perhaps get to know their playful, fun and endearing sides. What I'm trying to say here is that the adjustments that you make enable you to be satisfied that you are providing the best possible care and in the long term, improving the health outcomes to that for that person. Um, so what are reasonable adjustments? One thing is communication, as we've all talked about today. Um, I've included um, a link to this document that I created um, at CRD a few years ago. Um, it steps out the adjustments um, to make it easier for someone with um, intellectual disability, not only to follow the conversation, but to be involved in it. Here are just some of the, the different things that, that they talk about. The re this resource really highlights the adjustments that help why they help and give good examples of how to embed them into your practice. Um, another reasonable adjustment, and I know that we don't always have time for this, but there are plenty of good examples online um, and templates online that you can use. Um, um, Easy Read is a is a the preferred um, written format for people with intellectual disability that incorporates a photo next to text to um, contextualize the meaning of what, what's in the text. Um, there are many gamut of, of reasonable um, adjustment resources um, listed here are just a handful of ones that have been made locally. Um, the My Health Matters folder um, and admission to, admission to discharge are ones that um, include some visual aids or tools that um, express the, the most important things about that person that you need to know. The others are um, helpful tips for conversations, um, whether they're visual or, or just ideas to, to have that conversation, those hard conversations like end of life. Um, one of the things I do want to um, kind of just bring your attention to is trauma-informed care. Um, sadly, 90% of women with an intellectual disability have experienced sexual abuse. Um, and along with the 62 uh, percent of people with intellectual disability that have experienced violence, which is almost double that of the population. Um, I'll pause now for that, those stats to sink in and then just ask you to remember that when you're seeing your patients, especially women, that I ask you to, uh, to engage in that trauma-informed care. Um, 
And also, sadly, that evidence suggests that compared to women without a disability, women with intellectual disability do not access cervical screening or breast screening at the same rate. Um, so it's less than 10% of people have regular cervical screening. Um, and we understand that 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 um, allied health clinicians are in a position to, to have those kind of conversations over time. Um, and uh, with the the advent of of self screening, um, that it might be, if, if if it's appropriate within your session to have that conversation about maybe going to the GP, um, and 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 having that conversation with their GP, we really encourage that. Um, CID over the last couple of years have really um, upped the game in in um, creating resources um, for health professionals. There um, are resources being added almost monthly now. Um, a lot of those resources are easy read resources to use within appointments um, to help explain particular things that you're doing um, or processes that you're going through. So I really encourage you all to to um, to check out this site. Um, and lastly, um, you don't have to go it alone. And I know that we've we've talked about this quite a lot um, today. Um, but yeah, use use those avenues for communication. Upload things to my health record when possible. Um, ensure that you know teams are working towards the same goal, and you're not duplicating or or being counter counterproductive with with your therapies. Um, annual health assessments. I feel like we all have a responsibility to to ask whether people are having their annual health assessment and to 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 let them know that it's a free um, medical appointment that they can have with their GP annually, um, and really promotes that preventative health. Um, journey for them, um, and as I say, communication aids. Use, use visuals where possible. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, everyone's different. And um, just asking that question of, of what would make, you know, these sessions more accessible to you um, helps and goes a long way. Um, now I'm going to open up the floor to any questions. Um, was there any questions in the chat, Bertha? There are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, we can go through the first one from top to bottom. Tess, how would you best go about initiating a case conference with external supports for your client? For example, post-op, uh, coming in for a gym program, case conference with behaviour support plan coordinator. Um, so from our side of things, what we tend to use is the support coordinator as as the person who can help coordinate that. If there isn't a support coordinator, it is something that we could do as part of our team if a person is a patient of our service. Um, but I suppose it also depends. Um, so are you talking about linking it? Um, so a post-op and coming in for a gym program. So if there are a person who is linked with a team from the hospital, um, the best person to talk to really is the nurse on the team. So if that's the orthopedics team, can you ring and speak to one of the nurses from the orthopedics team? Um, you may not get through the first time and you might need to leave a few messages. I, I do appreciate. Um, your other option is um, having that person, you know, can, can the patient or the carer ring you while they're in the post-op um, appointment? Can you be communicated with, um, can you be contacted when the person is already there talking to the team? So when the team come in the ward rounds. If the person is linked to a disability team or us, then we can certainly coordinate those between the inpatient and the outpatient teams. Um, the other, the next question is then who to contact within the hospital. And sometimes it can be a bit of an, an awful web. I do absolutely acknowledge. Um, since COVID, every single health district has now a, a person or a team within the health district that look at NGIS issues, um, disability related issues for people coming into hospital. And they are the people that link with their um, NGIS health liaison officers. So if you don't know who to ring, that could be your point of contact, calling the main hospital line and saying, can I speak to the NDIS team or the disability coordinator? They called something slightly different in every district, unfortunately. Um, but you can, yes, of course, ring and try and speak to 
the specialty team within the hospital. Um, or you can ring one of our teams or the, the specialist intellectual disability health team and they may be able to help you navigate through just who to ring. It is also, probably Sorry, also worth, I was just going to add, it's probably also worth noting um, that Health Pathways does have some information around um, sort of some of those specialist teams and who to contact. Um, so, for example, I noticed that palliative cares on there, there is a specialist intellectual disability palliative care team that is opening at Prince of Wales Hospital and those details will be on Health Pathways. Um, Health Pathways is primarily, I guess, more of a, a, a medical, like a GP resource, um, but allied health clinicians can have access to it. And one of the key things that is really useful about Health Pathways is um, the referral information. So local services um, that are relevant to particular needs. So if you don't have access to Health Pathways, feel free to shoot us an email after the session and we can link you in. Um, it's worth just having that in your, in your, in your toolkit to refer to. Tess, did you want to answer the next question? Um, so should all persons with a disability be afforded post-op care regardless of age? Um, so in theory, yes, a person with any disability should be offered um, what anybody else in the general population are also offered. The reality of that um, is that then reasonable adjustments do come into play. Lots of people don't cope well with being in hospital. They are busy unpredictable environments with questionable food at times, a lack of, you know, sort of other, other activities in their life. And perhaps sometimes providing that post-operative care at home is more appropriate for some people. So um, in, yes, they should absolutely have options provided to them. Um, and then it should be a discussion about what is most appropriate for that person based on their own situations would be my opinion <laughs> from the OT <laughs> sitting on the side. Um, um, but obviously we, we also need to recognize that different teams have different um, skills and experience in working with people with disabilities. So certain teams do that better and have amazing, um, you know, gold star clinicians that understand reasonable adjustments, come from, you know, disability backgrounds perhaps or have really good knowledge um, and have done lots of training and other teams don't, um, unfortunately. So um, we would all like things to be an ideal world, but unfortunately they're not always. So there is a patient liaison officer in every hospital that if you do have concerns um, or a patient has concerns that they would like to talk through that is the best person to talk to um, and providing feedback to your hospital positive or constructive is also really useful. Thanks. Thanks, Jess. Um, I noted just those, those last two comments. I guess they're similar to the other earlier, what I was saying about health pathways, but we do acknowledge sometimes you, you don't always get through to the team that you want to when you, when you do call switch at a, at a hospital. I, I, the other, um, service that we provide here at the PHN with, with the GROW project is service navigation. So yes, that is primarily within the primary care and community space. However, we're very well linked in with the hospitals um, through the specialist disability and intellectual disability teams, but also more broadly. So if there is an area that you're really struggling to get in touch with, or you don't know who that right person is to, to to speak to about a particular person, um, whether that be finding a new service or trying to get in contact with an existing service. We're also, we're also here, here um, to support that. So feel free to give one of our service navigators a call. So that's Claire um, or our other team member, Jen. Um, we're really eager to help out with this, with this service navigation side of things. And sometimes there aren't services available, but that's also a component of our project is to sort of find out where, what services are missing, where are the gaps, um, is, the, is the information not available for our clinicians out in the in the region? We want to make sure that it is accessible. So, we, what, like Tess said, we do appreciate the feedback, both positive and negative, because that helps guide our work. And really, we're here to support clinicians. Are there any other questions? Questions, comments, any other cases, any other queries that you want to? Um, bring to Tess or, or Kim as while well, we've got them on the line. Otherwise, um, we might 
finish there. So thank you, um, speakers and attendees. Thanks everyone for logging on so late in the year. We appreciate everyone's enthusiasm to be here for a little bit of education as we um, race, race towards Christmas. Thank you, Kim and Tess for joining today. Really appreciate it. Um, the evaluation survey will um, be made available in the chat function um, and will, it'll, it'll also be provided after the session. We will be sending out the slides to your emails as well. We really appreciate your feedback. Um, please fill those surveys out to allow us to issue your certificates. Um, thank you very much. Have a lovely, uh, have a lovely day and enjoy the rest of the year. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye.